started uh, this morning, I'm going to invite uh, His Excellency, the High Commissioner of uh, Canada to Tanzania, Zambia, and Seychelles, Seychelles and Comoros, Mr. Kyle Nunas, to give his uh, remarks. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Excellences, distinguished representatives, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. A special thank you uh, to all the, of the panelists for sharing your time and expertise. Uh, I'm honored to help open this important discussion, given how committed Canada is to help addressing food security challenges in Tanzania, in Africa, and globally. We appreciate this opportunity to explore avenues for partnerships. Uh, food is at the center of human culture development and our shared prosperity. Uh, the foods we eat and how we grow them define how we consume natural resources. Recognizing this interdependency is not new. In Canada, a deep and genuine relationship with the earth has long been a central tenet of First Nations, worldviews, and philosophy. Our food systems are deeply interconnected to economic growth, to health and nutrition, to climate action and biodiversity, and to the empowerment of women and girls. However, the multitude of shocks over the last decade have put front and center the fragility of our food systems. More than ever, it is crucial for all countries to build innovative agricultural systems that are resilient to climate change. And we all need to work together to achieve this goal. We have everything to gain by breaking down silos and recognizing the links that bring our work together. Agriculture remains one of the most important economic sectors for the continent. Africa is home to 60% of the world's arable land and has the potential to meet not only its own food needs, but also those of the rest of the world. The African Union has, seized with the, has been seized with the importance of agricultural productivity over the de past decade. More recently, uh, it brought the global spotlight to this issue when it declared 2022 the year of food security and nutrition. Tanzania has demonstrated its leadership in convening this week's Agri Africa Food Systems Forum, uh, which aspires to position Africa as the place for innovation and investments that advance stronger and resilient food systems. I congratulate them on what will certainly be a successful event. While supporting global efforts to transform food systems is a critical part of Canada's international assistance, we know that advancing gender equality is the most effective way to reduce poverty and build a greener, more inclusive, and prosperous world. This is the heart of our feminist international assistance policy. The fact is, we simply cannot transform food systems if women continue to be undervalued and undercompensated. Transformation must be grounded in gender equality and local lived experiences if solutions are to take root. I applaud the recent commitments of African nations at the Human Capital Summit to remove barriers that prevent women and girls from accessing education, healthcare, and economic opportunities. Like other partners, we are deeply concerned about the rising fertilizer and energy prices. The issue of fertilizer affordability is interrelated with other long-term challenges such as low returns on investment for smallholder farmers, decreased soil fertility, and biodiversity loss. Canada is committed to addressing food insecurity and malnutrition in Africa. Our response to the global food crisis is to focus on transformation and building resilience of agri-food systems. This is particularly important for vulnerable smallholder farmers, the majority of whom are women in the African context. Over the past year, Canada has announced support to AFDB's African Fertilizer Financing Mechanism. This is a key tool to address the evolving challenges of food and fertilizer crisis, in particular for women and smallholder farmers. Uh, we are providing a loan of up to $55 million to ETG, which is an agribusiness that supports the distribution of quality fertilizer and agricultural inputs to optimize yields of smallholder farmer farmers in Africa. 
And last but not least, Canada's 4R Nutrient Stewardship Project. This signature initiative works with the private sector to improve agricultural productivity and farm income while increasing resilience to climate change and promoting best practices in integrated soil fertility management. And I'd like to recognize Clyde Graham from Fertilizer Canada, who will be on our panel today. But Canada and other countries can only do so much. Together with the private sector, we can do much, much more more. The private sector has much to offer in building innovative solutions. Uh, they have a broad base of expertise from research and innovation to supply chain management and market reach. Together we can ensure accessibility and affordability of fertilizers for farmers, in particular small-scale farmers, who may otherwise struggle to access these resources. This is why I'm excited uh, to open this discussion. With, private, with the private sector to explore how together we can increase food and nutrition security through improved food production and empowerment of smallholder farmers. This is an important first step that we uh, could carry forward, uh, both ahead and beyond of the upcoming African Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit. Merci tout le monde. Thank you. Asante san. Thank you very much, Your Excellence. And we now moving into the next part of our program where we have a series of uh, presentations that are going to spotlight some of the innovations and investments that uh, the private sector is making to spearhead uh, the continent's uh, agricultural development. Our first presentation uh, is going to be given by Mr. Mehdi Falali. He's the Vice President of uh, uh, Pharma Solutions at OCP Africa. Uh, Mr. Pelari, uh, you are welcome to, take, to give your presentation. Thank you, Shem. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to share with you some insights about uh, OCP Africa farmer-centric approach in the continent. Excellency, the High Commissioner, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, OCP uh, Group is a one century company. It's, uh, sorry. It has been created in the 1920s uh, and it started by being a mining company, uh, mining of uh, rock phosphate. After that, OCP Group has uh, progressed by uh, diversifying its activity, by developing investment in, uh, in uh, processing of uh, the rock phosphates and in the fertilizer production starting from the 1960s and, and starting from 2007 OCP Group has progressed by being a corporate company uh, and uh, developed uh, several activities by creating several subsidiaries in different areas like engineering, like uh, in uh, security and excellence operational uh, with the creation of the GV of Dupont de Moor and the creation of OCP Africa, that is a subsidiary dedicated to, uh, to support uh, the sustainable development of agriculture in the continent. Why this special focus on Africa? Because OCP Group is, uh, uh, the headquarter is based in Morocco, so it's by its DNA, it's an, an African company. So uh, uh, OCP's engagement in Africa is rooted in the conviction that small order farmer are at the center of, of, of the solution. Uh, we know that there is some challenges in terms of productivity. We have quite low productivity uh, in, in our agriculture. Uh, and we, have, we are also affected by, uh, by climate change and by the impact of climate change. And we strongly believe that uh, the small order farmer is key to, uh, to uh, uh, I mean, to, to pass, to, 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 uh, to succeed and to develop, to transform African agriculture as they, uh, they represent more than 80% of the farmers in our continent and more than 80% of the production. Uh, for that, uh, OCP Africa based its approach uh, uh, to support holistically small order farmers through some major commitment. First commitment is to make the fertilizers available at scale, customized 
and at scale in the continent. And uh, last year we have been supplied 2.5 million tons of fertilizers in the continent. One fifth of those fertilizers were part of a very important and unprecedented fertilizer relief program, uh, which represented 550,000 tons of fertilizer that has been given as, uh, uh, with a discounted price and uh, as a donation uh, to support the, the specific and the difficult situation of high price of uh, inputs and, uh, and food last year, food product last year. Second commitment is to be soil health partner. And we, have, we are heavily investing in soil health programs with our strategic partner, which is UM6P, the University of UM6P in Belgrade, and with international uh, research institutes and local universities and research institutes. And up to date, we have been uh, investing in uh, programs that are uh, targeting more than 10 countries in the continent and that are uh, developing solutions uh, uh, that are targeting areas that exceed 90 million hectares of soils. Additionally to that, the first step uh, uh, of, uh, let's say, developing customized and adapted fertilizers is to know the needs of our soil. So for that, we have been developing and investing with our local and international partners. We always work with local research institutes and local public-private partners. We have been investing in 50 million hectares digital soil mapping uh, across the continent. Third commitment is to develop farmer-centric initi initiative with significant impact. All this R&D is good, but if it's not on the ground, if we don't disseminate this to the smallholder farmer, explain about the good agronomic practice, about how to manage the soil head, about how to, how to improve its yield by efficient fertilization, how to facilitate the market linkage of the smaller the farmer will not get the result. So for that we have developed several flagship programs and we have been supporting more than 2.5 million tons of, uh, uh, sorry, more than 2.5 million of farmers through uh, those uh, different uh, programs and uh, I can uh, highlight some of them like Agri Booster Program which is uh, a contract packages, contract farming uh, the farmer hubs, which are, and I will uh, deep dive on it, like uh, a specific last mile distribution channels that when we can find also uh, training and services. And with uh, <coughs> a mobile laboratory, and we have like uh, 16 of them all across the continent, which is called OCP School Lab, uh, that is doing soil analysis for free, and, uh, and uh, also that is uh, uh, doing some trainings for farmers. Uh, several initiatives also in agri-tech to support youth, youth entrepreneurship, to support also women entrepreneurship and to empower more women cooperatives have been, have been developed, additionally to uh, digital uh, farming uh, platform facilitating the, uh, the market access and market linkage uh, and access of input to, to small other farmers. Through our, all of these, those initiatives, we have been developing strong partnerships. We have more than 160 partners all across uh, the continent, with uh, more than 100 that are just in, in the R&D project. <clears throat> so this map just uh, is showing, uh, I mean, some of our uh, soil health integrated soil health management pro uh, programs and, uh, and our values partners we are working with in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in different areas of the continent. Uh, uh, those programs are uh, tackling different uh, I mean, issues of soil health, uh, from soil acidity, soil uh, salinity, and improving the biodiversity of soils and the soil microbiome uh, to be able to have uh, an efficient uh, fertilization. So we have uh, some uh, quite good results by applying those uh, soil health uh, programs with the uh, increase of yield that can uh, reach 200 percent, between 100 and 200 percent in some areas. Here, with the example of Cote d'Ivoire, in some crops like maize, rice, or uh, uh, oil palm. An example of the uh, uh, demonstration that we do uh, uh, here, it's in Ethiopia. It's about TEF. And we, we, have, we can see the difference between, between the application of the soil health, integrated soil health management uh, uh, in the field that is in the background. 
uh, with the, the, the first field with the, that is applying the, the, usual, the usual practices. So we have to speak a lot of things. This is just some pictures about our uh, mobile laboratories and the demo plot that we do. This is some farmer hubs. So this is the, the last mile, let's say, that we develop in, in the continent uh, by empowering cooperative, by empowering youth and entrepreneurs. And we have been developing more than 130 across the continent to ensure this holistic uh, uh, support, uh, facilitating the access to input, to, to the access to services, to small mechanization, and the training sessions that are organized in these farmer hubs. So up to date, we have developed the program in Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Senegal, and Cameroon. We are also investing in uh, uh, acceleration program to support youth, and we have we started in 2019 with the Ampers program that has been done in partnership with the uh, UM6P, University of UM6P in Bengal, and Ampers and the uh, Mass Challenge, and also we are developing. Uh, uh, more recently, the Farmer Innovation Program with UM6P, and the idea is to, to support you to develop uh, agri-tech uh, startups. Uh, in, uh, and we started this, uh, this Farmer Innovation Program in Cote d'Ivoire, and we are moving to, to other countries. <coughs> UM6P is a very strategic partner for us as it's an African university uh, that is uh, now a reference in the continent and uh, it's, uh, we are leveraging on its capabilities in terms of uh, with, with, with the, 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 the UM6P School of Agriculture uh, and also with the, uh, the extensive network of UM6P in terms of universities and in the whole ecosystem of innovation that has been created at, at UM6P with Venture Builder with Launchpad, with uh, venture capital funds, with uh, accelerating progr acceleration program, with the data center, which is the African supercomputer center, and uh, with uh, all the, 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 the startups uh, uh, that has been created in the ecosystem of UM6P. So just to give you a perspective of our new programs, the new flagship programs that we are working on, on the top of all what I presented, so there is three initiatives that we, we are working on now and we are designing and we are also willing to work with partners on them. First one is about carbon farming and how to de-risk all the initiatives on carbon farming as a, as a solution in terms of carbon sequestration and also as an opportunity for farmers to increase their yield and their income sustainably. So this is the first initiative. So second initiative is about flexible mechanization by uh, supporting uh, and de-risking all the initiatives that are pay per use for mechanization. And uh, for that, we have also uh, a program on that, uh, knowing that uh, this uh, mechanization, uh, large-scale mechanization, will be a part of the solution for the transformation of our uh, African agriculture. Last but not least, it's a program about storage finance. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about the creation of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the farmer in our continent, uh, they are suffering from different uh, kind of issues. First one is that uh, they, are, uh, 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 they have a lot of losses uh, because of uh, not good quality of storage at the farm level that can go until 40% of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the losses. And also, they are selling their product just after the harvest. And it's the worst time to sell its product because the, the prices are very are low and there can be a difference of price between 20 to 30 and even 40% and even in the price between the harvest time and the peak season. So all the idea is to develop warehouse reset system by empowering private social ventures to develop this kind of systems and, uh, and, and enabling those farmers to have access to credit by using their product as a collateral for, uh, for uh, financing. So this is about our uh, three new flagship programs 
that we are working on and we are willing to, to work with uh, different kind of partners, all the stakeholders and the partners that are interested in to, to co-design and to deploy this program across the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Filali, uh, for sharing the perspectives of our OCP's investments on the continent. We are going to continue with uh, the fertilizer industry investments on the continent. And our second presenter is uh, Mr. Clyde Graham, who is the Executive Vice President of Petrosa Canada, and is going to address some of the investments coming in from the Canadian um, fertilizer industry in Africa. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, and I uh, just see if we've got the slides coming up. Oh, I've got the. As always, it's usually it's me. All right. represent uh, 50 companies based in Canada or doing business in Canada from manufacturers to distributors to companies that deal with farmers on a day-by-day -day basis for their fertilizer and other uh, input needs. Um, and um, increasingly I think we've been recognizing the importance that of uh, the Brundtland Commission's uh, position of economic environmental and social sustainability, and all three have to work together. Uh, and sometimes I think the economics gets lost uh, in the other aspects. So this project uh, uh, started in 2019, right before the pandemic. The goal was to reach 80,000 smallholder farmers, 50% of them women, and the focus is on three countries, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Senegal. Uh, thanks very much to the generous support of Global Affairs Canada, the Government of Canada. The total project is just under $17 million over this five years, uh, with $2 million coming from our private sector. Uh, a number of our companies, I'll show you, uh, made very specific private sector contributions to the uh, project. Uh, the program has always been meant to be scalable. Uh, we've designed it so that the four R's and the components that support the four R's in these countries could be taken on and moved to other countries. And we hope that other parts of Africa will emulate this program and we hope to, uh, to carry on in the future on that. Uh, and uh, so the, the funders of the project are Global Affairs Canada, the Cooperative Development Foundation, which is our key on-the-ground implementation partner, which represents some of the largest agribusinesses in Canada, which are, in fact, very large corporate uh, commercial entities. Uh, Simplot, International Raw Materials, OCP, uh, we've heard before, Nutrien, which is the world's largest fertilizer company, Solio Agri Agriculture, which is, in fact, a cooperative that serves farmers across uh, Canada for their needs. Uh, ag growth, which supplies all kinds of logistical and uh, fertilizer handling uh, equipment, and Shell. Uh, and, and Shell has a division that handles uh, sulfur as a fertilizer uh, product. The project's focus is on 4R Nutrient Stewardship, which is a stewardship program that was developed in Canada and the United States uh, uh, going as far back as 2006. Um, and it involves the very core principles of agronomy of using the right source of fertilizer or manure, uh, the right rate of application, applying it at the right time and in the right place in the field and, uh, and near, near the sea. Um, the scale of agriculture in Canada, particularly in Western Canada, is immense farms. Uh, range in size from 5,000 up to 40,000 acres. Um, and the size of the farm equipment that's being used in this scale is immense. And the production that Canada gets is also uh, uh, tremendous. And you might ask, how can a system 
designed for that large-scale agriculture work in Africa. And I would simply submit that if you take a seed of maize or wheat or a soybean and you put it in the ground, it has no idea whether it's being grown in a 40,000 acre farm or a one acre farm. The standard principles of agronomy of the four R's apply. So uh, the African Plant Nutrition Institute, Shami and other members of the team have been the leaders in terms of making sure that what we have is a very rigorous and science-based program. And just through four our learning centers in communities in Ghana, Ethiopia, and Senegal, uh, we reached just 40,000 men and, and uh, uh, women farmers through uh, learning centers, uh, learning sites where they can actually see the results of using four our fertilization on the crop yields and the health of those crops. But we've also had a huge reach beyond that through our partnership with Farm Radio International, a Canadian organization that's done all kinds of radio programming, and we have extensive programming on YouTube as well. I encourage you to check it out. So the, the, the results, particularly in uh, countries like Ghana, where the fertilizer use has been less, uh, uh, has, has not, has not been as advanced in some other car, uh, countries, have been amazing, and it really supports the African Union's ambitions of uh, increasing fertilizer use and crop yields. Um, ultimately, while food security uh, does depend on more food production, the greatest factor for food security is higher incomes. People with uh, the income and the revenue to purchase food are in a much more food secure position. And we hope that it will become for Africa uh, in the future. And I won't go through all these, but it just lays down some of the uh, yield improvements we've had on crops like uh, maize in Ghana, groundnuts in Ghana, uh, maize, groundnut cultivation, and I won't go through all of them. All this information is on the 4rsolution.org website. Um, we've also done, I think, a very good job of training people who are going to be leaders in advising farmers in their communities and, and through agri-dealer outlets uh, throughout uh, Africa. And uh, slide there. Uh, particularly proud of our youth program with 4R, uh, 4H Ghana, uh, which reached uh, 3,600 youth and other community people with 4R programming. We've also worked with uh, Canadian and African universities. We have programming for women, particularly through cooperatives, and uh, some of the results there in Ghana and Ethiopia. Um, and I'd say that we can take some credit, uh, hard to know exactly how much, for the growing confidence in the 4Rs as an important tool for the future of African agriculture and for food security. And I point to you, you to the Lumi Foundation in West Africa, where the 15 countries there uh, certainly encourage the use of 4Rs across the continent. What lies ahead? Uh, we, our project will be winding up in March of uh, next year. We are hoping to be able to extend the project. Uh, we want to build, expand to other countries, as you can see, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, and Malawi. We want to build greater capacity and extension in universities and all kinds of different infrastructure. Obviously, you can't go very far unless you partner with other people, and there's a wide range of people we'd like to have deeper relationships with. We did focus on women in this project, but we think that women and youth are a big part of this. I think the youth of Africa need to have a greater say in how their futures in agriculture are going to be determined. And then we'd like our private sector partners to increase their funding from two million to four, and who knows, possibly even five, uh, even more than that uh, going forward. So thanks very much. Again, www.4rsolution.org. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Clyde. We are moving forward to our third um, 
presentation and I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Kai Wells, uh, who is the uh, Senior Advisor for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and is going to present some of the work that the uh, WBCSD is doing to support uh, food and nutritional uh, security globally. Thank you. After my talk, it will be a bit easier to pronounce WBCSD for everyone. It's, 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 it's challenging. So, <laughs> no, good morning, everyone. Um, when I when I came and, and sat down in the first row, the room was empty, and now I'm looking in, in the full room. That's really fantastic. So, thanks a lot for coming this morning. So, we really, really knew that the session is early. We're not sure if we get some attraction, but I think. The topic is important enough, so it's really great that you that you get up early this morning and be with us to attend this important session. Thank you very much. So it's it's a real honor for me to be part of the session um, this morning. So um, I would like to talk about the role of the private sector in the fight of food and nutrition security in general, and also I would like to to explain the role of the World Business Council and how we want to help the industry to accelerate action but also foster collaboration across the food value chain and then also with, um, with public partners. So who we are, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development is a CEO-led organization of around 200 multinational um, companies. Um, the, the purpose of the organization is to help the industry to transform their value chains and the systems they're performing in. Um, we are targeting three imperatives, so nature, um, climate and equity, so, and, and we perceive ourselves as the voice of the business for sustainability. On that slide, and of course it's, it's, it's very slow, but maybe you, you identify some of the usual suspects. So here you see our members, and in the, in the area of food and ag, so we are collaborating on an international global basis with 70 multinational um, companies. So, why am I here today? Um, in the World Business Council, in the, in the work we are doing, um, there are a lot of activities and work stream targeting food and nutrition security, but there is not one holistic initiative targeting this um, important issue. So there was some concern of members saying, hey, we need a more holistic, common perspective on, on that topic. And also, in the past, some um, NGO raised concerns that the industry, that the private sector as a whole is not doing enough to address the topic of food and, secure, and, and, and nutrition insecurity. So um, our mission is to improve awareness of this topic and support member companies to strengthen their commitment on food security. Um, so we want to create a, a common position which helps stakeholders to act. And um, our main purpose is to develop a food and nutrition security playbook, which we then will um, uh, develop and present towards the COP28 meeting. And that's also the reason why World Business Council um, initiated a, a task force to address this topic. So let's, let's stay a moment on, on that slide. And I think we all know the figures. We all are aware about the challenge and, in fact, we don't have to solve only one challenge. There are two challenges we have to solve. So the first challenge is, is the, the global food insecurity and malnutrition. So we have more than 800 million people on the planet which are um, undernourished. We have 3 billion people on the planet who don't have um, the right access to nutritious food. And if we continue like that in, in the next 20 years, so. Um, um, we, we have more people in the situation, so we have to produce much more food. We have to double food con, con, uh, production in order to feed 2 billion more people on that planet. At the same time, we, we, we must not continue to increase food production like we did in, in, in the past. If we do that, we, uh, we definitely blast the boundaries of the planet. So we need to produce more healthy, nutritious food for everyone, but in a, in a, in a nature-positive way. And let's, let's have a look at Africa. 
So in Africa, the situation is, is, is even worse. So we have famine risk and food insecurity increasing in basically all the sub-regions of Africa. Today, we have 200 million people which are affected. And there are projections that this number will double, uh, double until 2050. So 20% of the population in Africa faces hunger. 80% of the population is unable to afford a healthy diet. So therefore, we decided in our task force to really have this, or to, to help the industry sharpen the focus on Africa. So we want to continue our task force, our work with, with the lens of, on, on Africa, because we believe that's, that's the area, that's the region, especially sub-Saharan Africa, where the industry, where the private sector can have some impact. So, um, what is our message to, to our members, to the multinational um, companies? Of course, we see the private sector equipped to provide scalable technology and know-how. Um, we also see the private sector in the role to unlock investments in um, developments of the local food production systems here in Africa. Of course, it's, it's an opportunity for, for the, the big companies to take leadership on their um, sustainability commitments. But a clear message we give to our members is, if you don't act and if you don't do something to, to increase food um, um, security, so then of course, in the areas where you do business in this area, so there will be increasing business risk. So, addressing food and nutrition security means mitigating business risk, but also on the positive side, so we also see business opportunities for, for our members. So, um, we have identified action areas across the food um, security dimensions in the area of availability of food, access to food, utilization of food, agency and advocacy. But of course, this problem is too big in order to, to be solved by just one sector. So we really need here a, a collaboration between the, the, the private sector and the, the, the public sector because also um, there are action areas um, which are beyond the, um, the reach of the private sector. So in the area of political stability, in the area of investments in infrastructure, in the area of, of, of clean water access to water. So here really um, it's, it's, it's a collaboration of private and public partnership and uh, only together we, we can address those important um, building blocks. So I think we all agree the activities, be it the activities of the public sector, be it the activities of the private sector, they only can have one goal. And the goal is to help enable um, the food systems in Africa to achieve um, sufficiency, so food sufficiency in Africa. And the main action areas for the industry we see in sustainable intensification of local food production, and we have seen already some great examples in Nidis and Clyde's uh, presentation. So, um, and this has to be, of course, done in a sustainable way, so with the acceleration of climate resilient um, act practices. So it is in the, in the area of unlocking um, financial services and products to, to mitigate risk, to enable investments. It's about investments in actor. Yes, so the private sector needs, needs the player in the game to invest in fertilizer, in seeds, in crop protection, in digitalization. And last but not least, so it's, it's about um, help um, enhancing supply chain resilience and efficiency and, of course, so we need to take care that we help empower um, the, local, the local players in egg production and in the, in the value chain. So these action areas will be translated now in a, in a playbook, uh, which we will um, develop um, over the next months to be presented at our council meeting, which will be um, prior to the, um, the COP28 meeting in, in Dubai. So um, together with our members, so we want to create this common agenda for the private sector. Also, we as a World Business Council, we would like to act as the private sector voice on that topic. So to, um, to, advo to advocate for, for partnerships with the public sector, attract in investors. And, and of course, so this is just the start and towards um, um, the COP28 and beyond. So we will work here together with our members on a sophisticated so to conclude, 
Um, thanks a lot for your attention. So let's work together. Let's work hand in hand to reverse the trend of increasing food insecurity in Africa. So um, let's join forces and let's let's try to um, to empower the local food systems here in Africa to, to become more independent, more productive, more resilient, more equitable, and more nourishing, but in a in a nature positive way. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, we are now moving to the perspectives of uh, the uh, you know, financial uh, services. And um, then, uh, Bob, who's the head of uh, strategy for uh, 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 sorry, uh, Ben, who is the head of Strategy Alliances uh, Transition Finance at Rabo Bank, is going to provide uh, some perspectives on uh, some of the investments that Rabo Bank is undertaking to support agricultural development in Africa. Ben, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning. Very nice to see you all. I need to find out how this works. Um, yeah, my name is Ben Falk, uh, Rabobank and Sustain Africa. I have two roles, two hats, and I will tell you a bit about both and then share a couple of thoughts about how all this um, project work, uh, in my view, should be directed to make for a better future for Africa. Um, if you look at the Rabobank website, you will probably see this. Uh, changes every day, of course, but growing a better world together, this is uh, yesterday's status. Uh, it's our global mission. We are a Netherlands-based bank. Uh, our main focus is on financing the food and ag business, and um, we are by origin a farmer cooperative network. Um, in Africa, we basically focus on four things. We have a regional office um, in Nairobi, with a mandate for uh, over 10 countries providing trade and commodity finance and corporate banking business. We have Rabo Partnerships, which is our uh, investment and advisory arm. Uh, a colleague of mine, David Gerbrands, is here in the room, um, one of the leaders and managers in uh, Rabo Partnership, doing wonderful work, amongst others, through an investment vehicle called the Rise Invest, who are invested in the banks you see in the lower left corner. They have Rabo Foundation, who has been doing impact investment for, um, well, they say on their website 45 years. Actually, in the Netherlands, it was much longer than that. And recently, we added Acorn, which is a vehicle for um, unlocking carbon credits for smaller farmers. Basically, they, these smaller farmers plant trees around their land, we model how much carbon is sequestered by those trees, and we get 80% of the carbon credits as a payout to them, 10% to local partners, 10% for running the platform. So here you see the numbers uh, so far, and we hope uh, to do much more through ACORN. It works uh, amongst others in Kenya at the moment, and we're uh, developing it into other countries. Now then there's an initiative called Sustain Africa. We initiated it last year uh, on the top of the fertilizer price spikes, price crisis. And it was a real crisis, honestly. It really affected volumes in many countries. Um, and there's this very direct relationship between fertilizer use, especially in areas of low fertilizer utilization, like most sub-Saharan African countries, and food production and food security. So there was the thing, and, and we were very uh, happy to be able to form a platform of many, many partners um, with projects, well, basically, uh, much like, like OCPs and 4Rs, so, uh, but focused specifically on the most vulnerable countries. Um, we've done 13 countries. Uh, now we have provided 126,000 tons of fertilizer, 1.6 million farmers. Increasingly, the work is moving more towards advisory uh, besides the on the ground work. So that's a very nice development to see. 
And we've recently uh, wrapped up or are wrapping up our first country. And uh, you will see, because the prices are coming down, luckily, um, one of the questions for our learning agenda basically was this. Why are prices that are falling down on international markets, why don't we see that same development in local currency? So why are prices staying high? And then the first answer, and I will go more into this question later, but the uh, first answer people will give you, well, it's local currency against the dollar. Well, that's true for some part, but it's not the full explanation. So the further research question then is, of course, what else is there? Are risks perceived to be getting higher? And actually, that is the case, so I'll speak about that. We are developing the Sustain Africa Fertilizer Monitor even after we wind down the operations of Sustain Africa next year. Uh, we will uh, still have that monitor active to monitor the markets and situations and reinitiate the action when necessary. Um, so looking at that question of uh, fertilizer prices. Uh, here you see uh, some prices in, uh, of fertilizer in uh, local currency until mid uh, this year. Um, the yellow line is Ghana. Uh, much of the explanation of the uh, enormous price spike in Ghana is indeed that local currency devaluation. You see that also in a few other countries like in Nigeria, the green line. Um, but is that the whole story? It's a good question. Um, if you look at uh, that exchange rate developments on the right hand side, you see a graph that more or less looks like that. And actually, uh, consumer price index on the left is also important because that basically is a proxy for the farmer income. Consumer price is much linked to food price. There's not much data on food prices per se, so we take the consumer price index as a proxy. That's basically the, what the farmer gets for that crop. Now the point is, if you carefully look at the scale, is that the exchange rate development, and that's basically the cost of farm inputs, rises quicker than the inflation. So the business case of farmers is contracting, is getting worse. You know, the question whether they make any money when investing in good seeds and fertilizer, that's basically one of the questions that keeps them busy. And that was especially uh, tight last year. Now, um, why is that exchange rate so volatile? Of course, one can always point at the central bankers in Washington or in Beijing. But honestly, uh, a lot also has to do with um, public sector finance and public debt in African countries. And basically, what we see here, all these graphs basically tell the same story debt levels to GDP are rising and rising and rising. Uh, the, the lowest uh, um, graph is basically a division of countries in low risk, green, medium, and high risk. And you can see there's no low risk country left. So debt level, and that's one of the other explanations, of course, companies are seeing this and are understanding that Dealing with countries, trading with countries, getting more and more risky, also from the public sector side of uh, point of view. Um, I'll uh, finish in a minute. Uh, yeah, two. two even. Wow, wonderful. Um, so there, there's this issue, you know, local currencies are depreciating, risks are getting higher. Security risk, of course, regions that are, you know, uh, at, at the brink of war. Some countries that are really in war again, unfortunately. Um, but also debt levels that are unsustainable. So what is then the message for food systems? What do we need to do? Um, here you see that food imports are part of that problem. Actually, why is debt rising and rising and rising? It's because there's a trade deficit. And part of that trade deficit is actually food imports. And it's a significant part in many countries. It's about billions of US dollars. If you take all of Sub-Saharan Africa together, it's about tens of billions of US dollars every year. Added 
because it needs to be financed somewhere and it's financed through debt, right? So every year we see these debt levels rising. It's like the water is rising. At some point, you know, we need to keep our head above the water. And how are we going to do that? Well, the partial answer that food systems can provide is we need to make sure those food imports go down. That is the key thing, dear friends. We need to bring it down significantly. So basically what we need on a national level is programs that identify the big chunks in the food import bill. So this is a message for ministries of agriculture and ministries of finance. We need to look at the big food imports and we need to have specific programs to bring them down. And we need to tap on all the experience of these projects that we're doing, what the wonderful farm advisory that OCP is doing, the, the amazing and innovative approach of the uh, 4R, uh, the crisis response of sustain and other experiences. But honestly, it only works if you do it together. Fertilizer is only going to work if the produce is sold into markets. So we need market linkages, we need good links with research institutions, etc. That holistic approach is needed to bring food import bills down. Few countries are doing it uh, relatively successfully, successfully, like Ethiopia, Nigeria, and a few sectors, Rwanda, but we need to do it on a much bigger scale. And this is an agenda beyond individual projects. So, I'm still trying to figure out how this is going to work on a country-by-country -country basis. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for providing the excellent insights from uh, Rabobank. This brings to a pause. This brings to a pause the series of presentations that uh, we had to introduce the key topics uh, and depth nicely set the stage for the further discussions that we want to hold uh, in a panel discussion as we further probe into some of the issues that affect production, distribution, as well as uh, access of fertilizers to improve food security, but also do it uh, with an enabling and supportive economic and uh, business environment. So I just want to invite uh, our speakers to come and sit uh, in front uh, as we get into uh, the uh, panel discussion uh, session. Uh, so I just want to invite all the speakers uh, to come forward. Um, and, and then in addition to the speakers who have made the presentations, the panel is going to include um, Mr. Anthony Chamanga, who is the Chief Development Manager for Taha. And uh, we are also going to have in the panel uh, Ms. Uh, Ruth uh, Zaipuna, who is uh, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, the uh, NMB Bank in Tanzania. And um, we have uh, additional panelists, uh, Ms. Nana Aisha Mohammed, who is the West Africa Program institutions driving the most impact in investment that can help uh, achieve economic uh, development, uh, especially with um, a focus on smallholder farmers. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shamir, for the question. Uh, in the interest of time, please allow me to just say all protocol is observed. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. And uh, for those who are joining us from outside Tanzania, please uh, welcome to Tanzania. I hope that you will enjoy your stay in Dar es Salaam this weekend, this week. And uh, please find some time to you know, visit some of the world class uh, safari options in Tanzania, particularly over the weekend. Now, um, before I respond to the question, please allow me to provide some context around the smallholder farmers, particularly in Africa. Uh, and I will provide some research findings here. So research findings show that smallholder farmers make up a significant percentage of uh, individuals employed in agriculture across Africa. But also it is estimated that 
almost 60% of the population of sub-Saharan Africa are small border farmers. About 20% of sub-Saharan Africa GDP comes from agriculture. Now these are significant statistics. However, I think access to financial services is a critical barrier for smallholder farmers in Africa to achieve their full <coughs> economic potential. Smallholder farmers in Africa, they face a huge financing gap. And this is because of many things, including financial institutions actually find lending to smallholder farmers to be risky. And the uh, research actually shows there that um, impairment charge, particularly for the cultural sector, is twice as high compared to you know, other sectors in the economy. But other reasons that are causing this uh, significant financing gap to uh, smallholder farmers include lack of uh, suitable financial products. Uh, many financial institutions also do not have the physical presence close to where smallholder farmers work, but also farmers themselves are likely outside the formal banking sector, and I think most of them are not bankers. Therefore, financial institutions have a significant role to play in driving economic empowerment of smallholder farmers. And this can actually be achieved by you know, access to affordable financial uh, uh, products and services. And these may include you know, savings, credit, insurance, etc. And over the years, uh, these products that I have just talked about, they have uh, proven to have the potential to make a difference. But now to respond to the question uh, on how financial institutions are driving the most impact towards uh, economic empowerment of smallholder farmers in Africa, please allow me to go on the experience of the organization that I said, and that is uh, NMB Bank. At NMB Bank, we believe that financial inclusion is a pathway from poverty to prosperity, especially for smallholder farmers uh, in our communities. But uh, once they are financially included, they actually need capacity building, they need access to financial services, they need the right products and solutions at affordable prices. So what exactly are we doing at NMB Bank? So first at NMB Bank, we are very committed to ensure that we provide these smallholder farmers with access to banking services. We are very committed to ensure that we provide these smallholder farmers with access to banking services. We are investing in branch network, we are investing in agents banking, but also we are investing significantly in digital channels. And of recent, actually, we have, um, we, we have really invested in digital channels. We have a, a whole year campaign uh, on digital solutions, which we call it Teresa Digital. And, uh, you know, with this campaign, our direct sales staff are actually across the country. We are opening accounts, we are making sure that these small holders, these, these small holder farmers are using the financial and digital solutions that we have end-to-end, -end, including opening accounts, transacting, but also uh, borrowing. In addition to that, we are coming up with very innovative products and solutions that meet the small holder farmers' needs. And, um, in Tanzania particularly, uh, we have a Finscock survey report that recently has indicated that uh, many smallholder farmers in Tanzania, they struggle particularly with regular expenses. With almost 67% of them, you know, they are borrowing from friends and family members. And only 3% of Tanzanians are actually borrowing from the banks. And, you know, for us as a bank, we have come up with a very innovative way to ensure that we supply micro loan through digital micro loan proposition, which we call it Mushko Faster. And Mushko Faster is an end to end digital loan application and disbursement for amounts ranging as small as $1 to $200. So you, you can take actually your loan uh, using your mobile uh, phone. Uh, in addition to that, at the bank, we are actually leveraging on partnership. At NMB Bank, we have realized that uh, in order to empower these smallholder farmers, we can actually, we can't work alone. We need to work with partners. And we have a number of partners that we are working together to ensure that we, you know, continue to empower these uh, smallholder farmers uh, economically. Uh, on capacity building, 
we are partnering with a number of partners, including Rabo Foundation. Yeah, Rabo Foundation, we have worked together for almost 10 years, and together we have actually empowered smallholder farmers, particularly uh, those farmer based organizations on training, capacity building, governance, and all that. And uh, so far, we have trained close to 200,000 uh, smallholder farmers on governance and financial issues and we have actually made them financially uh, mature, and some of them have qualified uh, to borrow from the bank. But also on financial inclusion and uh, inclusivity, uh, inclusive finance, we are partnering with a number of partners as well. We have our FS FSDT, but internally in the bank, you know, since 2021, we embarked on a very serious mass account opening campaign with a target to open almost 1 million uh, customer accounts every year. Last year, we managed to open 1.2 million customer accounts, and at least just ensuring that we continue to bring these farmers in the financial inclusion uh, agenda. But uh, this year, we are planning to open over 1.5 million uh, customer accounts, and we are on target uh, to, on track to reach the target. I talked about the perceived risk on, uh, on lending uh, micro, uh, small uh, smallholder farmers. So de-risking and co-financing. We are leveraging guarantee schemes, including Africa Guarantee Fund scheme, but also we have PASS, we have ASEL, we have uh, ASEL Africa. All these are very important partnerships for scaling up uh, financing and uh, financial resources availability. But we have a number of other, you know, partners that we work together, particularly on input supply, uh, farm mechanization, we have strategic partnerships, for example, with the job peers, agriculture, all these are able to provide us and to provide uh, smallholder farmers with uh, equipment, farm mechanization, but now the bank comes in terms uh, of financing. Recently, we have partnered with uh, Vodacom Tanzania. Uh, with uh, Vodacom Tanzania, we are actually partnering on uh, device financing, uh, we are providing smartphones. Just to that we support the increased adoption of digital uh, financial products and services in Tanzania. Uh, the FinSOP survey showed that uh, while 75% of Tanzania already own phones, only 19% own smartphones. And this is very important in terms of digitization, and particularly for smallholder farmers, particularly when it comes to digital solutions. The government of Tanzania is a very strategic partner to NMB, so we are working very closely with the government of Tanzania also on a number of initiatives, and I believe you will hear a lot on the Building a Better Tomorrow uh, initiatives, where actually as a bank we have already partnered and we have committed for over almost 20 million, uh, 20 billion Tanzania shilling to finance uh, the working capital in that particular initiative. So I believe these initiatives and others can actually be scaled up to drive up the most impact towards uh, economic empowerment of smallholder farmers in Africa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Ituna, for highlighting some of the innovations that you are putting in place to overcome some of the challenges of financial access for smallholder farmers, which is a very key foundation for sustainability of agriculture. Now I just want to turn over to Ms. Nana Muhammad. Ms. Nana Muhammad, as the representative from AFAP, how can we meet the urgent need of short-term increase in productivity, but do so in a way that doesn't compromise the long-term sustainability of uh, food security and nutrition? Good morning, everyone. Uh I represent AFAB and slightly also Sustain Africa, um, working very closely with Ben um, on the Sustain Africa initiative. Um, if you look at the work that a private sector plays, I, I think private sector plays a very key role in, um, in the agriculture sector. Over the years, we've worked as AFAB, um, working with private sector to intervene in the agriculture space, more focused on the last mile. So I like to look at private sector in two, um, in two aspects more on the, in the global platform and also look at the last mile key players who I think are very critical to actually um, increasing productivity. I'd like to highlight um, the role that agri-dealers pay, um, aggregators and service providers at the farmer level. 
these are to me are the critical private sector that needs to be that we need to focus on and we need to support to be able to pro uh, properly deliver services to smallholder farmers, especially when it comes to um, addressing the in the issues of productivity. Um, in terms of the role that they do play, it's their critical roles in terms of providing services to farmers and also input and also aggregating outputs. And the key thing is to look at this in, in a more um, value chain or holistic value chain approach where we focus on building particular value chains, organizing and mobilizing all of our efforts around particular value chains and being able to then address particular key, um, key bottlenecks around the value chains. One of the things that we have to also look at is creating an enabling environment, being able to bring private sector to the table, not just global or larger scale private sector partners, but also the smaller private sector partners to the table to have those kind of discussions. Um, if you look at uh, the role that, um, in terms of farmers, farmer interfaces, and if you take into consideration what also are the bottlenecks for those particular private sector partners, you realize that there are key bottlenecks that they also are smaller or SMEs have uh, to face that also impacts their ability to deliver. So I just don't want to highlight the role that they play, but I also want to highlight some of the challenges that prevent them from playing the critical role that they also have to play. Key one is access to finance, technology transfer. Globally, larger scale global companies have all of this new technology. Things are changing on a day-to-day -day basis. We are talking about new technology, we're talking about ICT, we're talking about soil testing and new products coming up day-to-day -to, -day to address regenerative agriculture. But that technology is not trickling down to those particular private sector players that have a day-to-day -day or interface directly with the farmers. And that is what I think that needs to be done. So private sector at the global level has, and I can see that happening, I, I think uh, Mehdi highlighted some of the role that I, um, OCP is playing, um, we also have some, some of those critical things that other private sector players are playing. Earlier this year, we did a, a scoping in partnership with Fertilizer Canada, just looking at the four hour principles and the four hour approaches. And one of the things that we also found was that a lot of private sector partners are playing a critical role in terms of disseminating the four hour principles or even promoting the four hour principles without necessarily even noticing that they are doing it. And being able to package that and highlighting that for me is a critical thing as well to, to, to sort of like amplify what is being done in a very small way, but then also supporting them to be able to scale it up. And um, if we also look at um, some of the, the, the policy enabling environment, for instance, that can support private sector to do more, we can look at, uh, I think Ben's presentation shows the differences, because I'm from Ghana, so I'm gonna be a bit biased about highlighting some of the critical things, in it, like some of the examples from Ghana. So if you take, for instance, the fertilizer market in Ghana, previously was heavily for, uh, subsidized or subsidy driven. In one year, because government couldn't afford it, it all came to a stop. No shops, no preparatory, um, preparations to even provide like a sort of a backstop for farmers. So farmers were left with nothing. Basically, no, um, so private sector had to step in. And I want to highlight also that with the, sub, uh, the, with the sustained initiative, we made a call to private sector and they came, they stepped up. They stepped up to say, no, we, have, we see the critical role that our smallholder farmers play in our business ecosystem and we need to come on board with fertilizer. They only didn't come on board with fertilizer, they came on board with extension services, providing extension support, technology around the use of the products, um, even all the way of supporting in terms of cash Demo, establishment of uh, demos, demonstrations to sort of like help farmers to get the right knowledge and be able to use the product better. The whole thing about soil is also nutrient efficiency. Nutrient use efficiency is quite key in terms of productivity. And that is one of the things that I'm seeing private sector increasingly focusing on, developing new products that are responsive to the soil needs or responsive to um, the crop nutrition needs as well is one of the critical things that um, private sector is also doing um, increasingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mohammed. And we want to zoom in again into the efforts of the fertilizer industry. And uh, Mr. Apilavi, uh, OCP is one of the biggest uh, players in the fertilizer supply. Um, E e e chain, and um, as 
a key value chain uh, player from the fertilizer industry. Could you shed some light on some of the major risks that uh, you face uh, in the input supply chains? And how can we work collectively and collaboratively to address um, you know, some of uh, you know, the risks that uh, you face as the fertilizer industry? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Shami, for the question. I think that, uh, let's say more generally, our food systems in Africa are uh, suffering from some risks and uh, mainly linked to external uh, shocks and to supply chain disruption. Why? Because uh, our food consumption uh, highly depends on importation. We are uh, like one third of the calories that are consumed in the continent are imported. Uh, and this is even uh, uh, worsened by the fact that uh, with the climate change, one, uh, one, uh, one degree increase in terms of global warming will uh, conduct is conducting to 10% decrease in terms of productivity of our agriculture. So in terms of fertilizers and in terms of inputs, it is the same and even worse because 80% uh, of the uh, nitrogen fertilizers that, uh, that are consumed in the Sub-Saharan Africa are imported. And 100% of the potash fertilizers that are consumed in the continent are imported. So uh, uh, this is uh, how we are, uh, I, I mean it shows how we are uh, vulnerable uh, toward these uh, external shocks and this uh, uh, disruption of the, of the supply chain. So I think there is some levers that uh, we can work in uh, on a, a partnership uh, way to mitigate those risks. First one, I think uh, we can, uh, we have to work on value chain approach. Uh, I, I think it's very important to identify critical critical, uh, let's say, crops in terms of food security and uh, to work uh, in a coherent way between various kind of partners uh, 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 to, to develop, uh, uh, let's say, to, to increase the efficiencies of the supply chain. If I take the example of rice and Cote d'Ivoire, the country is consuming 2.1 million tons of rice while he is producing just 1.3 million tons of rice. And in terms of agri-ecology, there is everything to produce, to be, to be even a big exporter of rice. But uh, it's still there is some pain points in the supply chains. Uh, for example, uh, the access to certified quality seeds, uh, uh, to have also modern agricultural production uh, in coherence of the, of the, of the nature and the, the sustainability. Uh, lack of investment in agro-processing. Uh, lack of investment in logistics. So I think one solution is to make all the stakeholders working on specific value chains coherently and the investment of the one when there is the investment of the others. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, uh, can be one level. Second, second level, if we talk more specifically about fertilizer uh, industry, I think we have to, when it makes sense economically, we have to encourage the local production of fertilizers and the valorization of local resources. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, because to, to, to do so, we should have the local resources in the country and we should have the market. Uh, if if the, the, the country market is not enough, it's important to work in a regional way. Not only in terms of fertilizers, but also in terms of food production. To work on the complementarity of the countries inside one region in terms of food production and in terms of fertilizer and inputs uh, production. But to do so, I think it's important also to, uh, to support and to accelerate initiatives like the uh, Africa Free Trade Zone initiative. Also to work on the regulation of inputs, to have like harmonized regulation of fertilizer at a continent level. Uh, and this will facilitate the trade of fertilizers and the flow of fertilizers inside the region but inside the, the world continent. Uh, last but not least, we have to work on the, efficient, on the fertilizer efficiency to optimize the fertilizer that we have. And uh, for that, I have spoken about the soil health initiatives because if the, you don't have the good quality of soil, you will connect 
with even if you use a lot of fertilizer, you cannot have the good productivity. So it's important to work on that. On the, on the soil health, integrated soil health management, and on the 4R, on the uh, uh, I mean smart fertilization, on the customization to bring just the nutrient needed by the soil and the crop, and to increase yield. And also, uh, uh, I think last point is to, uh, to invest also in supply chain. Because uh, uh, in all the countries you, and the regions, you must be able to develop the local uh, production but you should be able to import upstream of the agricultural campaign, not to be the dependent, to mitigate the risk about those uh, shocks. And for that, you should have storage capacity, warehouse, uh, warehouse capacity to, uh, at the, the country level, close to the ports, but also a network of distribution inside the regions and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a very efficient plasma distribution channel. Especially, we have to develop those areas that are not well uh, deserved in terms of availability, availability of the, the product. And this is, uh, let's say, uh, in that sense that we have mentioned this initiative that I explained about uh, the, the farmer hubs. So this is uh, uh, some insight about uh, the, question, the question. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Yes, to continue our conversation, I want to uh, turn now to Mr. Ben Bok. Uh, we are seeing in the news, but also you highlighted in your presentation, the major challenge with the uh, devaluation of currencies in Africa. So we see that the continent continues to face major headwinds uh, following the COVID disruptions and then the uh, war in uh, Ukraine, and then also the increasing impact of climate change in the context of uh, different uh, geopolitical uh, challenges on the continent. In these uncertain circumstances and times, what areas of action um, will the private sector, uh, uh, or uh, can the private sector prioritize to strengthen Africa's SME, SMEs and other food uh, supply chains? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, first of all, um, there's a lot of challenges. Let me also speak a few words of hope. There are places where it's totally happening on this continent. There are South African farmers that make over 10 tons per hectare of maize yields on their land, rain fed. It can happen. Uh, there are places here in Tanzania, where you better do not provide any fertilizer to the soil because the soil is so fertile, it generates between five to eight tons per hectare. So, um, you know, there are, it's definitely possible. We have uh, examples from very efficient supply chain linkages. Now, if we do one thing as private sector, I think it would be to strengthen those supply or rather value chain linkages. So linkages between input suppliers, agro-dealers, farmer communities, off-takers of their produce, uh, processors, and, and retailers or marketeers of food products. Those linkages are basically what also unlocks finance. If I look as a banker, as an SME, I will look at their suppliers and their supply linkages. Maybe there's some supplier credit, which is a very strong sign of confidence in that SME. And I will look at their off-taker market. So I'm constantly looking at those external linkages. And that same is true for farmers or farmer communities. You know, if they don't know what they're producing for, how is that going to affect their yields, their production, their motivation to invest the best. So linkages, that is basically the first thing, stable uh, commitment. So I really, really like to see a number of companies uh, that are also uh, part of the Sustain Africa platform who have uh, invested very, very long term in country relationships, in, you know, development of warehouses, dealer networks, uh, knowledge sharing. 
that is, in my view, the way forward. I'm speaking not so much about the financial sector itself. I realize that. Um, I think we're taking a lot of slack out of the financial sector by introducing digital platforms that cross that last mile, uh, by doing the things that, that Ruth mentioned. I think on the public sector risk, or the, the political risk, if you will, that I mentioned, uh, we need specific tools. And the World Bank tools are, are quite okay uh, in managing that, for instance, the MIGA uh, product offering, there are a few other ways to mitigate country risk. So that is basically um, an area really to look at blended finance. Uh, but other than that, I think the, pri uh, the private financial sector is really taking a lot of slack out of its processes and um, offering increasingly through digital platforms the services they have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, in the discourse of uh, investment in agriculture on the continent, we tend to overemphasize production of food crops, but I think the angle of horticultural crops uh, is a critical part of uh, the investments that are needed to work towards sustainable food um, systems. So to address some of the perspectives from the horticultural sector, um, Anthony uh, Chamanga, can you... Uh, you know, elaborate based on your experience on how the private uh, uh, private partnership create an enabling uh, environment uh, to scale uh, sector investments across Africa, and then also if you could um, address some um, examples from your work in Tanzania, as you have been working with the Tanzanian government uh, as an association for more than 17 years. Yeah, thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, uh, for me and my organization to be part of this discussion. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yes, it is very uh, important for the government and private sector to work together in a bid to uh, have the right business and other environment uh, for transformation of horticulture. And, uh, you know, transforming horticulture requires a comprehensive approach. You need to go to the farmers and other actors in the value chain uh, with solutions in production, in market access, in access to finance, entrepreneurship, etc., etc. Uh, so uh, this needs uh, the right uh, policy and the related frameworks so that various actors in the value chain are able uh, to, 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 to operate uh, efficiently. Uh, so, workable public-private uh, partnership are important with the government or, or with the private sector, uh, uh, rather taking the, 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 the role uh, of a leader and the government taking the role of a NABLA, because it is the private sector that is on the ground working by, uh, day by day to, uh, to, to ensure that uh, the uh, sector uh, attain a uh, desirable uh, growth. Uh, so uh, in Taha, and by the way, Taha, we are uh, an association of farmers and other actors uh, in the value chain. We are member based, and we work to promote and develop uh, Tanzania horticulture. I'm happy that some of our members are in this room. I, I saw Hara uh, from Rexman, uh, former vice chair of the board. So our members, we have. A, a, a mix a, of uh, members, different categories. We have producers, uh, we have exporters, we have service providers like input companies, and uh, I, I, I'm already targeting OCP to become our next member. Uh, so, uh, and our, the, our, we have structured our membership in a way that uh, we have created symbiotic relationship that members uh, benefit from uh, from one another. So uh, through uh, working with the government and other partners, we've been able to address a number of issues in market access, and input registration, and, and the related issues. Uh, today, we are seeing an increasing number of input companies, uh, seed, fertilizers, pesticides, and technology companies like irrigation uh, systems. Uh, because uh, we have been able to improve uh, business and urban environment 
uh, in horticulture. Now, uh, through our work, just to give uh, some highlights of, uh, of key achievements that we have been able to, uh, to attain. Uh, through our work, uh, we have been able uh, to get the horticultural industry in Tanzania uh, grow tremendously. Fifteen years ago, uh, production was only less than five million tons a year. But today, we are having over seven million tons, actually 7.3 million tons. Total agricultural uh, production in Tanzania is 29 million and 7.5 million, which is about 25% comes from horticulture. And uh, what is not being said very much is the contribution of, of horticulture to food security. Uh, in the Tanzania food security basket, we have cereals and non-cereal crops. Now, uh, for non-cereal crops, we have two of the most important commodities. We have potato, we have banana, with a combined production of 3 million tons a year, which is equivalent to 17.5 million tons of total food production in the country. So you can imagine uh, how signif significant is the contribution uh, of, of horticulture to, to food security, but of course nutrition security and income security. We, uh, we, we are, uh, the government and uh, other partners are now embarking on uh, getting more youth uh, engaged in, in agriculture and horticulture is at the, defo at the forefront because it attracts participation uh, of youth in, 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 in horticulture but also women and we've been seeing uh, an increasing level of participation uh, of these two important groups uh, in, 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 in horticulture. And now also we are, uh, we, we are seeing an increasing involvement of financial institutions. Um, I'm so happy to, to see NMB. They have been uh, leading uh, in a bid uh, to improve access of finance uh, to the farmers. And we are seeing uh, the transformation on the ground, especially investments in technology, increased market access. We are seeing some value chains like avocado growing tremendously. And, uh, and, and, and again, uh, we are seeing uh, increasing uh, participation uh, of youth and women. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, we'll continue our conversation um, you know, with Kai. And uh, Kai, as a coalition of uh, more than 200 forward-thinking uh, uh, companies, does the World uh, Business Council for Sustainable Development think that uh, the private sector is doing enough to improve global food security? That works. Yeah, thanks, um, Shami, for that question. It's an excellent question. So let, let me give, um, also looking to the time, a, um, a quick answer. And, and, and maybe I, I, I try to answer this question in a bit provocative way. So I think no. So um, I believe that the, the private sector can do more. Of course, we have, we have, seen, we have seen great examples this morning. So what the private sector does in order to empower small business to, to address food um, insecurity in, in Africa. Um, but let me, let me take here the 20,000 feet perspective of the multinational companies. And it is a fact that, that the majority of the business of our members is outside Africa. So among our members in the food and egg pathway, there's just one company which is 100% headquarters in Africa, and that's OCP. So I think we have to accept that, that those big companies, they are profit-oriented. So they are, they are focusing on return on investments. They need transactional business activities. And in a lot of parts of Africa, that's challenging. Of, co of course, we, 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 we know that there are good examples, and we know that there are areas where where running business in the food and egg um, segment is, is, is possible, is easy, but, but I think we, we need to, to understand that, that investing in agriculture, for those companies it's easier to do that in Brazil, in the US, or in, in Europe. That's, that's a fact. Uh, and, and, and there's a prioritization of, of those business targets over addressing food insecurity in Africa. So, of course, that's a call to the, to the public sector, so to 
increase the conditions, to improve the conditions, to allow more stable business, uh, political stability, um, so to mitigate risk for investments. But of course, so I don't want to make it too easy for, for, for our members, it's also a call to the private sector. So definitely we will, we will advocate for an increasing engagement and investment in Africa. Um, and it's, it's about to, um, to start investments here in Africa, maybe in a different way. We need, we need um, new approaches to work together. We need more collaborative business models. We need more inclusive business models, so where, where the big companies are connecting to the local players, to the, to the regional companies um, in, in Africa. Um, we, we definitely need to find ways to share investments, to share risk, and, and definitely one important tool in order to get there is to increase collaboration with the public sector. So we need to, to have much more stronger, powerful, business-driven, private-public um, partnerships. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. So to conclude uh, the, the round of um, questions, I want to turn over to Mr. Clyde Graham. You did present an overview of how the industry is responding to the uh, agricultural production challenges on the continent. But as a coalition of uh, fertilizer industry um, companies in Canada, how are you in particular engaging with the public sector on the continent, with government, uh, to uh, work towards more resilient uh, and sustainable food systems? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think for a lot of publicly traded companies and even some private sector companies, uh, doing, um, doing business in Africa seems like it's for, not for the faint of heart. Uh, there are challenges, uh, obviously, um, and but I, I would say I would like to commend the Government of Canada for starting a Canada-Africa ec economic cooperation strategy. They've gone out and have, are doing a wide consultation uh, with the private sector and other key stakeholders about how can we have a more robust relationship between Canada on an economic basis and the economy is much bigger than the private sector the private sector is key. So I think raising awareness of these things is really important. And of course the fertilizer industry in Canada is a key part of that. Canada is the world's largest exporter of, of uh, fertilizer uh, but very little of that fertilizer uh, goes to, uh, to Africa. But we're also a significant importer of fertilizer OCP has become a very significant player in the Canadian uh, agribusiness marketplace uh, for a number of uh, factors. Uh, I guess I'd like to maybe expand it and say though that one thing I've noted yesterday in some of the, the discussions I heard is there is a debate going on I think in Africa about whether Africa should be somewhat perhaps more uh, insular in its approach on agri-food systems. You know, uh, things like buy local, um, reducing reliance on imports. Uh, I don't hear a lot of talk, robust talk in Africa about exporting some of the excellent, excellent uh, products uh, that Africa produces in the food industry uh, where it has a tremendous competitive advantage. Um, so I guess I would sort of say as part of that, I would urge people in Africa to be cautious about not going global because there's a lot of investment there's a lot of innovation that is going on in africa but outside of africa and africa needs to be uh, needs to be part of it um, and i guess the last thing i'd sort of say is that from the private sector um, i think there's a lot of talk about the risk factors of doing business in africa but i think that businesses should be looking at, in a way, uh, from outside Africa, should be looking at partnering with African country companies, and, and even at the uh, agri-dealer level. Uh, and then uh, Asia, uh, you know, uh, our, maybe our member companies are engaged in things like joint ventures with companies, and I think those kinds of models can be robust. And some of the major projects that need to be done 
in Africa might be better done as consortia where the risk is spread out and you draw from much greater uh, types of expertise. So I, I think um, the fertilizer industry needs to be bold when it comes to uh, Africa and Africa needs to be uh, ready to accept that uh, uh, intervention. All right. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Clyde. I now want to turn over to the audience. Uh, we have had some very exciting, informative uh, discussion and presentations, and I have time for two questions. How do we accelerate the risking, taking cognizance that we are one of the big off-takers? Because already you've done a very good job with OPC and sustain when it comes to off-taking, uh, uh, working in partnership with particular value chain like uh, legumes, that is groundnuts, and beans, because these are now becoming an actual cash crop. As a big off-taker, how do we de-risk in partnership? That is my question, to accelerate that de-risking, to ensure more farmers have access to the fertilizer, to reduce the import of their own foods eating. It's almost like a, a paradox. If we increase fertilizer intake and we increase our yield with good clean seed material, we reduce importing food, then reducing their own GDP. How do we go about harmonizing this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll take the two questions together. Please, I'd like to ask you to be very brief and straight uh, to the point uh, so that we can effectively use the time left. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Sebastian Kingu. I'm a Tanzanian. Uh, I have a background of being uh, an international uh, investment financing consultant. And very recently, we are in the private sector. We have designed an investment model focusing to the African smallholder farmer. He has been pushed for too long for very, very little, I mean, very poor prices. Now, through this uh, uh, forum, I think we, will, we are going to develop uh, using partners. For example, the smallholder farmer, our model wants to transform the smallholder farmer to a big investor. For instance, if you help our farmers, if you take, sorry, it's not working. Uh, my voice is too big. Uh, <laughs> for example, we have a big challenge in Africa. For too long, we have been selling raw agricultural products. This is wrong. Time has come now for Africa to process all of our agricultural products. And our youth are the people to be in the forefront. Now, a simple example is this. We have to make all the small-scale farmers own large-scale industries. If you take cash on the farmers, let, let them own the large-scale cash on industry. For cotton, the same. So please, we are looking for all the partners here, local, NB and others. Please, let us work together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Agriculture, we have already approached. The BPG, you are good. We are going to work together. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the second one is uh, a comment, so uh, I'll not ask the panel to respond to that. But Ben, could you respond to the first question, please? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and your question about you risking, of course, uh, very valid. Um, with the danger of repeating myself, but your supply chain or your value chain linkages are the most important. Banks de-risking and public sector de-risking only comes after that. Your trade relations are the most important. So stable supplies of your suppliers, of the farmers that grow, that grow your crops. And your off-taker relationships, that is the basic fundament 
of your business, you know, in good times and in bad times. Um, that is that is the key thing, and that demands reliable behavior. Reliable behavior means extinguishing fraud or corruption. It's super super important because financial institutions. Investors are not going to come if they feel, you know, this, 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 we cannot depend on each other. That's the key thing. Honestly, a bank seems like a powerful institution, but it's totally in the hands of its customers. You know, in the reliable, uh, uh, creditable behavior of, of its customers, honestly. Um, so, so that is that is one. That is your your value chain linkages. Now, banks can do a lot, but we need to realize that banks are basically a transition institution. They get in savings and deposits, and they give out loans. If the loans are very risky, the savings and the deposits are at risk. That's the problem of banks. So what we can do is make the risk very transparent, very clear. But banks have to price the risk. That's the reason why so many of these loans have double-digit interest rates. It's super annoying, I understand that. But if the risk is double-digit, the interest rate of the loan is going to be double-digit. That's as it is, it's fact of life. Now the last thing, of course, is then de-risking the public sector environment. As I spoke about the public debt, the political risk, also security risks. That is really where uh, national governments and supranational, so multilateral institutions have to come in. There's no way around that. Um, and that's why I'm very happy to see that not only World Bank, African Development Bank, with AFFM as an institution, but also the IMF is really looking at solutions. Of course, you've witnessed that in, in Malawi, amongst others. So, um, you know, none of these solutions are perfect, uh, but the, it's basically about combining these several factors. Your value chain strength, uh, linkages, uh, local financial sector, and then not Thank you. Thank you very much. We cannot overemphasize the magnitude challenge that the continent faces with the rapidly growing population and uh, the need to accelerate ag agricultural productivity growth to meet the food demands of a population that will reach. Uh, 2 billion people uh, within the next uh, 20 years. And uh, we are also doing that, facing the headwinds of degraded soils and climate change. So business as usual approaches will not work, and I think what we cover today provides a business unusual uh, strategy where we can bring collective efforts of the input supply that ensures farmers have access to affordable inputs that are needed to increase productivity. Try to emphasize that it's possible to triple crop yields in Africa with the right fertilizers uh, used at the right rate, at the right time, and at the right place within the 4 r nutrient tractive framework. And um, with the current investment by the private sector, we are working towards a position where access and affordability can be resolved. But also farmers need the right information on how they can effectively and efficiently manage the inputs, which demands uh, strengthening of the capacity of extension systems to provide the right knowledge. And then also the financial services provide a catalytic role to ensure that farmers can afford and then also can uh, viably invest in uh, improving crop, crop productivity and then uh, linking to the broader value chain interventions as well that are needed for them to access viable markets to ensure sustainability. So it's about collective action across all the value chains and we need the innovations and solutions that are needed to overcome the complex challenges that the continent faces in 
production, financial services in markets, and other factors. We did not touch a lot on policy, and I think there's an area we have to fit into, uh, because the policy environment always uh, acts as a key bottleneck to the success of the in investment from the uh, private sector. So the public-private partnership will be very important to unlock the potential of um, African agriculture. We are working towards the Africa Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit, which is going to be held in Nairobi from 5 to 7 November. And this is the commitment of the African Union to have a coherent strategy for investment in sustainable fertilizer and soil health management as a key foundation for achieving sustainable agricultural transformation on the continent. And the last part of this conversation is very relevant for the discourse at the summit, which is essentially going to be the 10-year action plan of the African Union to address a lot of the challenges that we were talking about today. So for those who can uh, participate in that summit, that will be a great opportunity to uh, contribute to this huge initial effort to transform agriculture on the continent. I just wanted to end by saying there's a common African problem that says to go uh, fast, go alone, but to go far, we have to go together. Africa demands that we both go fast and far, and it requires innovative partnership to meet the concurrent needs of going far, but go very fast. Thank you very much.